Welcome to the show. It's Monday. I'm Chris Graham. We're joined by Rod Mullins. We're going to talk about Talladega yesterday, Sunday. Um, Rod, you know, you're not going to have a lot of boring races at Talladega. No. I don't know that you're going to have a lot of finishes, even though Talladega is always Talladega, like we saw yesterday. What a finish. Um, somehow there were cars still on four wheels at the end, and uh, one of them was Tyler Reddick. He got the win, but man, what a way to finish that race out there. Uh, and that was just, a, it was just a great race altogether. Um, I, you know, I really wasn't, I really wasn't enthused too much with the race as it had gone so far. I mean, Christopher Bell went out early, uh, early. He had some trouble. Um, you saw a lot of the jockey and going back and forth. You saw the train, you know, barreling through on the high side. You'd see one side on the low side and then the middle was left out of the bunch. Um, I mean, it was just one of those typical Talladega type races. I think the thing that left me scratching my head and wondering what were they thinking was Toyota and the manufacturers deciding to all bunch up and then get together and to try to form their own Toyota train up through the middle. And, you know, that was a good move in one sense because, you know, you're, the manufacturers are working together. I mean, the manufacturer is, and the teams are working together, but it ended up being, you know, the thing that pretty much, you know, could have cost them a race, but it also won them the race one way or the other. I mean, you had two cars that really survived that melee, and that was Martin Truex Jr. in the Joe Gibbs car and Tyler Reddick in the uh, Michael Jordan, uh, Denny Hamlin uh, co-owned team, 2311. So I think, you know, with the way that this race went, you know, and him leading 13 laps on the afternoon and then coming up, with the big win, especially when Michael McDowell there toward the end of it was using every bit of real estate that he could to try to block and keep Brad Keselowski and keep him down, you know, that losing streak that he's been having here um, for the last several years. Um, Michael McDowell just overdid it. Uh, and I think he was a tick behind. I think he was just a tick behind on trying to, and I think he may have overly corrected. And if you really want to say that, because I just thought that he was, he was throwing everything he could to the wind in hopes of trying to reach that finish line. And he was about to reach the finish line before he goes into the, into the direction or into the general uh, direction of Brad Keselowski. And I ran back and I went back and watched the video a little bit on that. Keselowski doesn't make contact with him. The initial, the initial contact or the initial turn is through the wind, is through aerodynamics. That's the first thing that grabs him, that train coming up through there, and he breaks it is what he does. And then the second thing is that's when the contact's made with, uh, with Keselowski, and that's when he gets spun around. But, you know, the melee that really happened after that, I mean, that was one of those things we would probably expect with five or six laps left to go, but it was on the last lap, and that made it very exciting. Yeah, you know, at some point there's nowhere to go. Everybody's racing for the finish there. Mm -hmm. um, so Michael McDowell, like you, you said, I mean, he was he was racing for the win. Is there any fault there, though? I mean, um, you know, on, on the one hand, he's racing for the win. On the other hand, um, you know, he he didn't have the car there at the end. Right. I mean, sh should he be faulted for for you know for causing what ended up happening behind him? No, I don't think so. I think he was trying to use every bit of real estate he could. And, uh, I think that was the general situation. I don't know he, if he had been in a situation quite like that before. Right. And I think, especially at a Talladega, when you have that much real estate, and like I said, he was using every bit that he could. Um, I just think that it was probably one of those mistakes. It's something he's going to have to live with and say, I was that close. I was that close to winning that race. And, you know, I just overdid it. I overcorrected. I over, you know, I overdrove the car and stuff. Um, you know, he had a car, I think that could have probably, probably won the race by inches if he had not gone and, you know, thrown himself in, in reality, kind of looked like he slung the car is what it looks like he did because, you know, that one thing when he goes to that high side and then he's just a tick behind and here comes Keselowski and then he starts to move, you know, you're going at almost 200 miles an hour and, you know, it's, it's sort of like taking nitroglycerin and, and, you know, shaking it up and then seeing what's going to happen with it. And that's what happened. But, uh, you know, what happened on back through there was just like, oh, Unreal. I mean, I, I had, um, I told my wife, I told her, I said, it's like shades of stroke race. 
there at the end of the race and stuff with uh, with Corey LaJoy up on his side and stuff. And I was just wondering, knowing Corey LaJoy, the way he is, and he likes to goof off. And, of course, it probably everything was happening so quick and stuff. But uh, it wouldn't have been, it'd been awesome if they'd caught him on the radio as he was going across the start-finish line screaming to the top of his lungs, how's this for spectacular? <laughs> because that's that's a Burt Reynolds line out of the out of stroke race, but that's what he reminded me of yesterday, the end of the race, and especially with him coming across start finish line. See, I I, I was uh, I I only watched stroke race. I was I was eight or nine years old. I mean, I can't I don't really remember the movie very much. I was remembering more Talladega Nights. I was expecting somebody to get out of their car and yeah. run to the finish line. Well, um, fortunately, no, fortunately, we we did not strip down to underwear yesterday or anything. We didn't have that happen at all. But yeah, yeah, the Stroke Race movie, I just yeah, there was there was almost signs of it. And then, of all things, I go back last night and I started figuring this out. I said, okay, Corey LaJoy comes across much like he did in that movie, like Burt Reynolds did. And then, of all things, on my search last night when I got onto YouTube, it pops up the throwback car that he drove, I think it was last year at Darlington of all things. It was the Clyde Torkel chicken pit car was what it was <laughs> the paint design. And I'm like, man, irony can be pretty ironic. Sometimes the way I kind of <laughs> looked at it. <laughs> so you were, t you were talking about the Toyota strategy, trying to create their own drafting line. Okay. So they did it. I mean, they, they all uh, went in for a, uh, pits uh at the same time late in the race i mean they were they, they thought they had it all figured out yeah and then they all bumped into each other <laughs> yeah how does that look on toyota that okay they had a plan but the execution was a little lacking yeah the, and it also shows too that um you know some of these drivers are probably better prepared at super speedway driving than some of the others um you know the thing that that got me was um Eric Jones, when Eric Jones hit the side of the, the safer barrier there, the outside wall, um, you know, I heard a lot of people last night at the end of the race talking about the fact of this reminded them of the hit that Dale Earnhardt took when he uh, got killed in 2001, I guess is when it was 2001 at Daytona. And it was, it looked like one of those hits where the car just fell all of a sudden, suddenly was turned around and then boom. And that's a, that's a credit to the safer barrier. And it's also a credit to some of the safety devices that are in there. They took him into the evaluation, uh, took him in for evaluation and then took him to local Talladega hospital. He checked out, he was okay and so forth, but now he had a wild ride, no doubt about it. And then, uh, some of the other cars involved in that, I mean, Denny Hamlin was involved with it. Denny Hamlin was not running, uh, you know, bad, on the afternoon and stuff yesterday at Talladega, but uh, it just happened to be that they all got caught up at the same time. And, you know, besides that, Christopher Bell had already gone out. You had Denny Hamlin, Bubba Wallace goes out. Uh, so you have one out of the two cars out of the stable at 2311 that survives and wins the race. So, hey, getting to the Michael Jordan thing, I don't think I've ever seen Michael Jordan happier probably with the exception of NBA titles. Uh, I think it, that yesterday and holding Tyler Reddick's son there at the end of the race, holding him up there and talking saying, you want to go see dad? You want to go see your daddy now? Let's go and congratulate him and stuff. I had never seen that side of Michael Jordan before. And, you know, some people might say that was, that was all a staged event, but daggone, it, just, it seemed like it was awfully sincere to me on Michael Jordan's part. You know, he's found a home. I think he's found a home in NASCAR. Um, been frustrating, but he's found a home in NASCAR. Yeah, you know, his team, 2311, had won some races. He just had not been at the track right. for any of the, and he's, he's at the track a lot, but it, yeah. it got to a point where there was talk about, well, maybe he's a jinx, you know, when he's right. there, they don't win. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's great for him and for NASCAR that, mm -hmm. you know, a superstar athlete like him now turned owner. He was an NBA team owner too. So, mm -hmm. you know, he's got those chops, but that he was there for the win. And then you get, you know, all those visuals, the videos, the pictures, the, the quotes after the race. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, we, we talk about it a lot. Uh, we haven't talked about it for a little while this season yet, but I mean, you know, NASCAR needing as much diversity in lots of ways, not just, you know, not just racial diversity, geographic diversity, fan right. diversity, and having a guy like Michael Jordan, who is a celebrity outside of NASCAR, mm -hmm. um, part of this winner's circle yesterday is huge for the sport. 
Yeah, and I think it's also another telltale sign, too, of how the sports kind of cross over with one another, too, because Jordan in his younger days, his dad would pack him up. And yes, uh, a black man taking his son to a race, which was traditionally held in the South, and then taking him on to go see a, a, a NASCAR race, go you know somewhere to go watch a race and so forth. And that kind of stuck with him. And, you know, when Denny Hamlin and him finally did hook up together and they started talking about this, you know, I don't know if Michael Jordan really had the idea at that point that, yeah, this is where I want to be at. But given what happened with the Bobcats and the Hornets and things like that, and how things have gone in Charlotte, um, he didn't necessarily have the Midas touch, so to speak. I mean, he's, he's touched everything. It's pretty much been gold, Jordan gold for one way or another, the shoe deals, all this other stuff, the endorsements that he's always been, he's always given. Gosh, you probably know this better than I do and stuff. What the figure at one point, how many, how much was he worth at one point or another? I mean, he was worth up there. Wasn't it quite almost like in the billions or well, close to low, billion something. He's in low B billions. Yeah. Which yeah. is uh, mm-hmm. remarkable for a guy who made his money in sports and straight yeah. from you know, having been an athlete, not, not yeah. a sports team owner. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that kind of told me right there that, you know, uh, I, when I say, let me it. correct. Okay. Not, not low B billions, 3.2 billion. Now I'm, okay. I'm finding one. So right. uh, that does, that's, that's healthy billions. <laughs> yeah. That's healthy billions and stuff, but he's still also thinking, and and I don't mean to say it this way, but miserly when it comes to the uh, paychecks and so forth, because you remember here a couple of years ago when they first started this team, uh, I think the comment was made either Bubba Wallace made it or somebody made it right when they started with that team. The, the comment was made that uh, you better start winning some races because Michael Jordan doesn't sign checks for losers. Yeah. And even though that, you know, that Michael Jordan had, you know, had been signing checks with the Bobcats and the Hornets and so forth, uh, I think he'd learned his lesson out of it. And he's got him a team. He's got a, a you know, and it doesn't hurt either when you've got Kurt Bush giving advice and technical advice and and so forth and kind of being an advisor to this team. He was standing there yesterday during the national anthem, standing right there beside a Tyler Reddick there at the or Ty Gibbs, excuse me, there at the beginning of the race. And so, you know, those guys, they're all sharing this information back and forth. And uh, you know, Kerr Bush, that I think that's probably a good move since he's has no potential at joining uh, racing again because of his concussions. So now he's a little bit of a technical advisor to them, and it's helped out. And I think it helped out. It's helped out Ty Gibbs a lot this year, although he didn't finish the race yesterday. Got in that wreck also, that Toyota melee. But uh, I think it's helped out Tyler Reddick especially. Uh, it's helped these young drivers kind of grasp on to some things and how they should act, how they should do, and uh, I, I think it's been great. I think it's a great thing for Michael Jordan in this whole thing. Kyle Petty, and I'm trying to think of somebody else. There was somebody else that made the comment that said this was absolutely just great for the sport of Michael Jordan winning in NASCAR. This was just a, a terrific thing happening yesterday. So we talked about all the, all the guys and all the teams who had good races, good days. Um, one guy who did not was the season's points leader, Kyle Larson. Oh, what mm-hmm. a weird weekend he had. Take us into what happened with Kyle this weekend. Kyle Larson ended up, the car ended up failing inspection. And when that happened, uh, most of his team was just pretty much, you know, they were to hit the gate, you know, and there was a joke and a little bit of a question. I think there was a meme that had even been put on uh, online on social media saying that he might end up having to be like Morgan Shepard in a truck race here several years ago. And that was uh, Morgan Shepard didn't have a pit crew. So he climbs out of the truck. He jacks up the truck and tries to put the tires on and everything. He said, I might end up having to do that. Well, then he gets there to the, to the track and then they, give him the punishment, the the penalizing out of it. And they go and they put him to the back. And then he has to uh, do a drive-through penalty through pit road. And so that put him behind. He was able to get back on the lead lap. But I'm telling you, he just, you know, just when he thought he could breathe and, and be able to move something and get back going again, something else would happen. And it would, it would knock them out of contention. As a matter of fact, all the Hendrick cars, I don't think the Hendrick cars, except for Byron, who came up uh, there toward the end of it, uh, they really, uh, Bowman, excuse me, Bowman came in at, at fifth. They were really not much in the top 10, except for Chase Elliott, 
and Chase Elliott led most uh, uh, several times during the race on Sunday, but uh, it was not a good performance for them. Uh, I would have expected more out of Hendrick. The one that I really got surprised with was Anthony Alfredo, who was driving for a no-name team uh, that just races a handful of super speedways. And yeah, I know he's got a funny last name. He's, he's drove the, uh, He's drove on the Xfinity series, but, uh, he drove of all things. He was driving the dude. What is it? The dude rag or the dude wipes, you know, dude, that's wipes, what it was. Yeah. dude wipes. He was <laughs> driving the dude wipes car. And that's one we were talking about at Martinsville. My son and I, he was talking about, how yeah, how do you get yourself involved in NASCAR like this? I said, well, it's good promotion and everything. Dude wipes it they're sponsoring the race and then uh going through yesterday during the interviews michael waltrip goes down through there at the microphone and he says oh he says hey anthony alfredo blah 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 something about the name and stuff and he says driving the dude wipes car and stuff he says yeah he says let's just hope we don't leave any skid marks <laughs> yeah. and it was funny too and i was like yeah. alfredo led the race and then he finishes top six it's probably one of his best performances he's had since he's you know tried to at least make a, a mark inside of the cup series talk about the xfinity race on saturday uh another crazy finish this one maybe even crazier double overtime uh and uh what do you know about jesse love the rookie 19 years old who was the winner he's got some potential this i think this is the kid if i'm not mistaken he drives for richard childress racing and they got him with the drop off of sheldon creed and sending him over to joe gibbs and, uh, it was, um, uh, I, I kind of watched him at Martinsville. And when I did, I was very impressed with him for a young kid driving. Um, you don't see a lot of these guys, you know, just take to the seat. Like he has some of them do Kyle Larson's one of them. You could go down the list and look at it, several others, but he showed some potential. And with that race, I'm telling you, it was that double overtime, but now he came out on top and, I was really glad to see him come out on top and Richard Childress and them needed this race. They needed a win and he needed to kind of show everybody, Hey, I've got a pretty good driver here in the stable that I'm just trying to get him through this rookie year and stuff. But in his rookie year, he goes and he outright wins one of the big super speedway events, especially at Talladega. And, um, we've talked about her before. Haley Deegan, um, had a good mm -hmm. run. She finished 12th, but, uh, going into the final restart, she had a chance to uh, to break the Xfinity Series record for a highest finish by a woman. Danica Patrick right. finished fourth mm -hmm. uh, in Vegas in 2011, and Deegan was in contention to to maybe beat that. Yeah, and you know, uh, Deegan, uh, give her credit where credit's due. I mean, she has she has taken a lot of lumps while she's been driving and so forth uh, during this season, and she's taken a lot of lumps, but now she has really impressed me here i think she has almost to one degree or another settled down some she has settled down to where she is she's come away with this and she's starting to get it a little bit better than what she did uh maybe a year or so ago when she first got involved in the sport uh but you know i i look back on this race for her um just a great race all together for her and then you know, I've really got to give some credit in here too. to a couple other drivers. Uh, besides that, uh, you know, Jesse Love, of course, we mentioned him winning the race. Riley Herbst, who drives for Ford, uh, drives a Ford car. Um, it was a big win for him. But you know what? I, the surprising thing was Love is only 19 years old. That's what surprises me out of it. And, you know, I've kind of like the Ty Gibbs sort of thing. It's it's kind of like he's he's there, but he says, you know, I've been on a journey. He says, I've been on a journey this entire time. And no doubt about it, he 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 has earned his his victory and stuff. And he said something about having PTSD flashbacks from Atlanta of all things. And uh, I think that goes back to the one of where the race where he did not finish very well. He had some uh, had an incident happen. So I think he was uh, he was well deserving of the win this time around. Another teenager won the ARCA race at Talladega this weekend too. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jake Finch won the Menard Series event. He's 18 years old. So uh, some young guys uh, yep. looking pretty good. That's uh, you know the future of NASCAR right there, perhaps. Yeah, and I saw Frankie Muniz, uh, who used to be on Malcolm in the Middle, I guess is the show. Mm -hmm. uh, he's back in ARCA right now. I think he was driving on the, he was driving on that early race that they had of the ARCA race. Um, he was supposed to go into um, Xfinity Series, 
but I don't think it's panned out too well. I don't think the the jump there has panned out, and Frankie is trying to get himself, I think, gathered up together. He wants to make a run at Cup, and uh, he ended up uh, running in that ARCA race on Saturday, and uh, I don't think he placed very high in the race and so forth, because I think he's pretty much had to just join a new team, uh, join a team that knows very little about him except for his driving style, but they haven't learned how to talk to each other just yet. So that may have been a big difference in the race on Saturday. The NASCAR is heading to Dover this weekend. What do you think we can look forward to uh, with the series there? High banks, mile and a half track. Um, anything goes at Dover, but, you know, as for uh, what we might see this coming weekend, um, a lot of close racing. I think there'll be a lot of close racing at Dover this coming weekend. And uh, depending on who has really learned a lot out of this, uh, out of this whole thing from Talladega this past weekend, we'll have to just wait and see what, uh, what's going to be the final, you know, the final judgment call on this as they go into, uh, in, as they go into Dover, because I think Dover is, is a different track. It's a different kind of breed of animal, uh, of a racetrack. And although it's a mile and a half, it's, um, you know, a mile and a half, almost, I think it's a mile and a half, but then at the same time, it's banked, um, the front stretch and the back stretch, both are banked slightly, uh, slightly, I would say almost in a way, a little bit more than Bristol, but not too bad, but the turns, I mean, going into the turns, especially, uh, very rough and it's all concrete. And I know that some of the drivers and, you know, some of the former drivers say they hate concrete. They just wish it'd just be you know, busted up, plowed up and everything else. But uh, Dover is always made for some good racing, but this is the only Dover race on the, on the schedule. And uh, Speedway Motorsports has taken over uh, operations, I think, at, uh, at the Dover track. And so this is one of those races that we're looking at right now that uh, is still on the schedule. Don't know how, long, how much longer it's going to be because there are so many people saying now that, uh, okay, if Bristol is not going to go and, uh, Bristol doesn't lose a race, who's going to lose a race maybe in the spring or something and only be one race per year. And some people are talking Texas. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but, uh, you know, Dover has already had to, uh, bite the bullet on this one. They used to have two. Uh, two uh, races, one in the spring, one right before the end of the summer going into the fall. And both of those races were very pivotal, I think, for some of those uh, drivers. But now this one, um, it's kind of like a warm up going into what have we got in the next week? Have we got uh, Talladega coming up or not Talladega, but uh, Darlington is going to be coming up here. And I think about two, maybe two more weeks or three more weeks. And then when that happens, uh, you know, we're going to have a throwback weekend. It's kind of to get them adjusted, so to speak, to that kind of track. Uh, because, you know, Darlington is one of those uh, tracks. It's kind of treacherous on some of these drivers. But, you know, there's one point that's come out of this whole thing uh, that I think that maybe NASCAR starting to listen. But I don't know if it's if it's really made an impact yet. Are they going to give these teams a little bit more practice time? you know, yeah. free practice time other than going out there and just running laps to see how things are, are going. Are they going to give them some of this time? You know, some of these situations have not worked out well for them. They've not been able to go and practice. They've not been able to do an open practice or go out there, run 20 or 25 laps, then come back off the track and stuff and see how things are going. Uh, NASCAR, the drivers are wanting more practice time. And I think that NASCAR ought to give them that. But now that's that remains to be seen where they're going with that. And then also for the collective bargaining agreement, if you want to call it that, um, heard a little bit over the weekend that things are still progressing, but they've kind of hit a a level spot right now. I don't know where um, one side is making a little bit more progress or making a little bit more demands than the other, but they've kind of hit a leveled off point. So we'll have to just wait and see what's going to happen with that one. And also, I think the other big uh, thing of news that kind of surprised me was NBC giving up uh, their rights, the CW to the CW uh, a year early on Xfinity series racing. Um, it tells me right now that NBC, although they signed a contract, NBC is almost to the point, I think of diversing themselves away from 
NASCAR. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, there's already the talk that Xfinity's, uh, they're going to pull the Xfinity name off of the series sponsorship because, you know, they just want to go in a different direction. Who knows where it's going to go? Um, it's kind of weird, though, to sign a contract like they did, like Fox and them did both. And then here it is, you start pulling back already, uh, not even the first year into your new agreement, you start pulling back immediately and saying, ah, we're just not going to go that route. So I don't know what's up, what's up with NBC. Don't know what's going on with a lot of these media empires right now, the way things are going. So it's, um, you're, you've got some, you've got some people that's jumping at things. Uh, CW is looking to make an impression big. Uh, but you know, I think it's, it's all leaning toward Amazon. I really do. I think it's leaning a little bit more toward Amazon. Uh, there's a lot of, I don't know how you have noticed it or not, but you know, I've started picking up on the, the critiques that, um, Fox is just not doing as well this year. Uh, and, and it's not talking about the, the race or the ratings. It's the coverage it's by, you know, going off to a commercial break, not going to the split screen. And then you miss a wreck. And then you come back immediately and cut a commercial off or you cut a commercial about before it's almost off and you come back to action. You've already missed the action. Uh, and a lot of people don't like the way that Mike Joy's been uh, you know, there for a while yesterday. Um, gosh, Clint Boyer, he, he sounded like he was, you know, the Bill Walton of NASCAR almost there for a while. He was talking things in outer space that I just was like, what? Where, where are we going with this and stuff? And Kevin Harvick would have to bring him back to, you know, bring him back to earth. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's definitely a, a, a changing world out there in the, in the scope of racing, however you look at it. Yeah. Between Amazon, Apple TV, uh, mm -hmm. Hulu's getting involved in some of these things. Now YouTube is getting involved in yeah. some of this. Um, there's plenty of people out there that will be willing to bid for the rights. Um, you know, and then it'll just be up to the fans to follow them. I know uh, baseball fans are not happy that there are um, not a lot, but even mm -hmm. just a few games of their home favorite teams. I know there was an Orioles game one a week or two ago uh, mm -hmm. that was on Apple TV. And I was at the game. Uh, Scott German from Team AFP and I were at the game. Mm -hmm. And we kept getting texts from people. What's going on? I, did, I decided not to tune in. Apple TV is too hard to load. Uh, wow. So they're paying all this money for these uh, rights. And, you know, you're relying on uh, people's Internet speeds to be good enough to be able to download. And for their side mm -hmm. of servers to have enough capacity to, to fix it. But on the other side of that, I mean, and I think we talked about this recently. Um, WWE sold the rights to its uh, uh, flagship show Monday Night Raw to Netflix for 10 mm -hmm. years, $5 billion. They got yep. they doubled their TV rights money uh, that they were getting from NBC uh, with uh, USA Network. Um, mm -hmm. And so if if those streamers are willing to pay that kind of money, that's where they're going to go. <laughs> yeah, well, you're right. And I mean, if you can if you could dial in on a package that's good enough, it's going to give you that kind of coverage, you know, and Amazon, this is me. Maybe this is crazy. Maybe this is pie in the sky sort of thing. I think for some reason, Amazon gets a hold of the Indianapolis 500 and maybe Indy Racing League after this year because, you know, NBC loses the rights after this year to the Indianapolis 500. And uh, if NBC doesn't go back and negotiate about it or they just don't want to fool with it, uh, Amazon could step in. And then if that happens, well, look who they're going to pick up. Dale Earnhardt Jr. He'll be doing some work there. You know, I mean, he would love to probably go and be able to do a race like that. Um, you know, he's, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's a very muddied sort of, I don't know, water right now with the way that some of these things are going with, uh, with NASCAR and with some of the other sports it's trying to keep up with them media wise has been crazy uh, this past year. I mean, I, you know, I saw the, uh, I saw the thing where you guys went to uh, uh, Baltimore and saw that, saw those, uh, those games and so forth. But I'm just like, you know, down here, you know, they were talking about Atlanta and, you know, Cincinnati went and swept the, uh, the angels this past weekend and stuff in their series and so forth. And I'm like, well, you know, it is the angels, but still it's, it's still an accomplishment, but nobody wants to talk about it back here. The same, that same kind of thing. Nobody wants to talk about it at all. They, I'd rather talk about somebody else. It's 
Yeah. Like the Braves. And I'm like, I could care less about the Braves. I'm sorry. I just hate to be that way about it, but I could care less about them. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the sports media you covering the media part of it. Uh, and we are the media, but covering mm-hmm. the media, uh, is as much a part of the job now as covering yeah. the, the races or the games or, or whatever else there may be. So, well, you got icons too, like John Sterling with the Yankees, even though we don't, you know, I, I, I don't watch the Yankees. I couldn't watch the Yankees, uh, and find the heart to be able to watch them anyway. But, you know, John Sterling missing from the Yankees and stuff and calling the, the ball games. Um, it just tells me, okay, how much longer is it going to be before 90 year old Bob Euchre just finally goes completely out of the box and, He's done. I mean, he's doing some games this year, isn't he? I yeah, think he's, Euchre's he's doing some games, games yeah, but yeah. But uh, I'm just wondering how long is it going to be before the old order, as it used to be of Major League Baseball, what you used to be comfortable with. I mean, I've already lost Brenneman. I mean, I lost Brenneman with Cincinnati years ago, yeah. and it's not really been it's not really been the same. I, I really just have to say that it's not been the same at all. But you know. Um, it wasn't the same either when Joe Knoxall passed away too, but you know, things change, things change. And we may see a, a, a new, uh, new thing atop the leaderboard when we go to NASCAR next year and broadcasting, who knows how it's going to be. I don't know how Mike joy may not even be in the booth next year. I don't know where they're going with this. Uh, so that's the reason why I guess they get paid the big bucks. And then here we are set here, armchair quarterbacking on Monday afternoon about media stuff with them. I don't know. Monday afternoon quarterbacking. Yeah, yeah Monday right. afternoon quarterback. <laughs> well, Rod, uh, so D- Dover this weekend. C- keep up with Augusta Free Press. We'll get we'll keep you up to date on the the details of the race, and then of course, Rod and I will get back on Monday. Well, Rod, as always, thanks for your time, man. Appreciate it. Thanks.